Welcome back to Following Know It Honest on my podcast. This week is episode 82, and we have quite the agenda on our on our list to talk about this week. We have chapters 88 through 9... That's not right. Chapters 97 <laughs> through 100 to talk about this week. How are you, Paul? I'm doing great. Uh, doing really well. Um starting to try and get in the Christmas spirit, you know, this time of year. Um, but also a little disappointed in my, uh, my guide, so to speak, doesn't even know what chapters we're talking about today. I didn't so. update on the outline. My bad. I'm doing it now. <laughs> Who is this guy? Yeah. Elliot, how are you? Also doing well. Also doing quite well. Busy time of year, but I'm enjoying getting away from it and reading some, some Stormlight here and there in between the busyness. I completely agree. By the time this goes live, this will be probably three weeks ago at this point, but I recently had the pleasure to go to Dragonsteel Minicon out in Utah, hosted by Brandon Sanderson and his company. And I just, I won't go into too much detail about it. I might make a a, a video about it, kind of recapping in a little bit of a vlog because I took some pictures and some videos. But I just wanted to say that the amount of commitment to quality that Brandon Sanderson has and his company have is really impressive. If any of our listeners, if any of you guys were ever considering going to one of those conventions, I highly recommend it. It was very well done. Very, very good. And I have to show off my, uh, my custom dragon steel 2021 water bottle. Whoa. Is it made from real dragon? Not that I've been told, but I wouldn't wouldn't say Problems. no. All right, before I ask for you guys two words for this episode, I just want to say a quick note about Oathbringer. If you guys couldn't tell, Oathbringer Part 4 and Part 5 are just huge info dumps of world building and mechanics of how everything works lots of questions answered and you, we were talking about this maybe two weeks ago that this is the information that i had when we started this podcast was we're approaching the the time when i the information that i had uh, when we started the podcast and pretty quickly we are going to the this podcast is going to shift into less you guys asking me questions and me knowing the answers to all three of us asking questions because I have read the rhythm of war, but I read it in like three days. So I probably retained 30% of it. Like I know the, like the general plot and you know what happens. I've got memories and stuff, but as far as like minute detail, which we all know is there, I'm not going to remember. So no way. Little details. I don't, <laughs> this probably not. You, you probably Never. got it at all. Yeah, you're Don't right. Everything. <laughs> so, so pretty quickly, it's gonna. This is gonna shift into all three of us just making predictions and theories. So, I'm actually pretty excited about that. All right, two words for episode 82. We'll start with Paul. Well, first off, Trevor, I would like to do a special introduction uh, for one of our patrons this week. Okay, uh, and then I'll talk about my words. It's fine. Um, uh, oh, sorry, my mug. Um, so this week, also, I'm starting to run out of mugs. I hate to say it, but like we're getting to the end here. Uh, this is we. It says CK. It says we are. You can't. You cannot tell what it says, but it says we are music makers. So I hope you like music. Uh, Retro Rocket is our person of the week here. Um, so thank you so much. He is a surgeon. And we are very, very grateful for Retro Rocket's support um, of our podcast here. And yeah, a huge uh, thank you and a happy holidays, you know, going forward and everything. So really appreciated. Um, I hope you enjoy music, I guess. Um, Retro Rocket's been around for like yes. over a year. So he's he was one of our very first listeners and contributors to our YouTube comments in our discord and he's been around for a while so 
Yeah, he's been supporting us before it was cool because we know how cool it is right now. So. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, <laughs> so a huge thank you there. Uh, it really means thank a lot. Thank you. Um, and anyways, my two words for this week are flee and flight. All right, flight and flee, Elliot. Has it only been like one time, I think, where we ever had the same words? I think it was a while back. We, we had one that was like similar. Yeah. There's a couple of times where you guys will use the same like ori- like origin word and mm-hmm. it's like a different, yeah. you know, actual word, but there's I think there's been one time where you guys had the same word. Well, we almost had another one cuz I wrote down flee and then I erased it and I went with different words. So I well chosen, well chosen. But the words I switched to are higher powers. All right. Higher powers and flee and flight. Let's use these four words and talk about Oathbringer. All right, real. go first. Before before we talk about words, I've got one more intro thing to get out of the way real quick. Okay, okay. I just have to show off my Rafo card that Brandon Sanderson gave me. So this is given to people when they ask a, a question during his Q&A sessions, and you get a, a special Rafo card, which means read and find out. He's not answering your question. It says, <laughs> Rafo on the front. I'm going to read what's on the back. It says, be proud. You have earned an official Rafo card. You received this for asking the right question at the wrong time. It might mean the answer spoils too much, or it might mean the answer would make people focus on the wrong things, or it might just be intended to keep you guessing. Regardless, it has been a pleasure to not answer your question. BrandonSanderson.com That's really funny. (laughs) So now, are you going to pull that card up anytime we ask you a question you refuse to to answer? Yeah. (laughs) It earned me a shirt, too, so that's what I'm wearing today. Was that because your question was like extra, extra not able to be answered, or... Your questions were just too good or I can't share what my question was because it's a spoiler. Okay. okay. I however I will say that we are coming up very quickly on me being able to share what my question is. So Okay. So I know what your question is. Okay. It is where did the idea come from for making you know, connecting Shalon and Light Song, you know, like <laughs> that's a pretty big jump. Yeah. As we all know, that's, that's a big true. jump. And like that takes a lot of, you know. There's a lot of inner workings there behind the scenes, so that's fair. That's a tough one to answer. You want to talk about your two words? Sure. Uh, well, one, <laughs> I just wanted to say, whenever Elliot has a similar word to me, it makes me feel way more, like, way more encouraged, because sometimes I feel like my word, I'm, like, really grasping at straws sometimes. And then Elliot's like, I have the same word, and I'm like, it's like, I was on a really good train of thought there. Or at least like really common with someone else. So that's we were on the same page. Yeah, Uh, my words. I feel like neither have like a super deep meaning. It's more surface level, but both of them have multiple uh, ways to relate here. Uh, Flight, first of all, um, that can definitely go into uh, Zeth's episode or chapter where he's like flying around playing paintball or whatever playing the game or the challenge with the skybreakers um there's also a lack of flight with our characters in shadesmar who like kaladin's used to zipping around and they don't really use stormlight anymore down there so um there's a distinct lack of flight there flee um mostly goes with our shadesmar people as they are trying to just basically flee everything they come into contact with um it it seems like there's a there's danger around every turn and they're trying to literally get out of shades more so kind of that entire storyline as well as delinar who i don't know i feel like we've seen him really try to at least in his flashbacks really try to like flee his circumstances or things like that and there's a lot going on so yeah Sounds good. Elliot? 
So I almost picked flee for exactly the same reasons that you just uh, explained there. So I'm glad I picked something else. I picked higher powers because Trevor, you alluded to this in the beginning. We're really starting to learn about some of the higher powers at work here. We get, I, I, I've been shocked at how informative the epigraphs have been like this, whatever this yeah. universe, you know, history book is that we're getting like, you know, tidbits of, oh my goodness. I, I'll caveat that by saying I, I'm assuming that's a trustworthy source, right? which might be a bit of a jump, but if it is a trustworthy source, oh my, it's like telling us names of unmade and exactly what they do and you know who they are like keep it coming this is answering all the questions but i also picked higher powers kind of for shadesmar in general it we're kind of getting revealed a lot of information about what's i feel like going on behind the scenes and i don't know if if your normal run-of-the-mill spread i'll say gets classified as like a higher power but kind of feels like that it feels like we're you know, almost like behind the set and we're getting to see like what happens, you know, in the, the moving pieces behind the curtain. So kind of cool. Yeah, for sure. There's a, there's a Raffo question on uh, Brandon Sanderson's website where he raffos most of the question, but part of the question that he actually answers is, is H Hesse's Mythica a reliable source? of yeah. information and somebody asked him that in a q a session and he says 90 percent accurate yes <laughs> okay so I don't like that answer so do with that what like you will either. so yes as as far as your reliable source there brandon sanderson himself says 90 percent accurate do with that what you will all right so yes. 90% you can just assume is always right. So I'm going to do that. Well, like you said, Paul, it's, it, that's an obnoxious number because 90% 90 90 I pretty much have to just assume it's all right knowing that I'm going to come across one nugget that's wrong. <laughs> that's true. That, exactly. Thanks, Mr. Sanderson. I have... So we're approaching a lot of the content that I've been looking forward to talk about for almost two years now. A lot of these, like the unmade conversations, some of these down our conversations, Shadesmar in general, like a lot of this content I have been waiting for for so long to talk with to you guys about because the pace that we set the podcast for, I mean, it's super rewarding because we actually get to spend time and talk about things that are important, but it it takes a while so we're finally getting to the end of oathbringer which is my favorite book in the series and i'm really excited that we're finally here all right chapter 97 starts with a flashback a kaladin flashback when's the last time we had a kaladin flashback and it's confusing because it's not I was confused at first because it's not labeled as a flashback in the, at least in the textbook. It's not, you know, it doesn't have the six years ago or whatever intro at the beginning. So I was very confused when I was reading this and kind of ended up taking it as more of like a dream than a flashback as if we're still with present day Kaladin. And he's just remembering or he's just dreaming or something of what happened in the past, as opposed to like us being, dropped in the middle of a scene in the flashback but yeah it was it's kind of intense huh it's really graphic too the flashback who the old lady that he's with basically gets her leg chopped in half and it just talks about it in his surgeon brain like oh yeah there's a bone sticking out i can name that bone like i don't want to read about this moving on like that's i don't like this this flashback but it's it's kaladin's coping brain he's he's lost people in in colonar and he's just remembering to a lot of people like back in the slave days where he would lose people so that's what that's why we're getting these
yeah, I didn't really pick up anything other than that. It just reminded me of like my nurse friends who start telling stories and it's like, nope, nope, don't want to hear anymore. Nope, no thank you. Right. Moving on. That's very fair. <laughs> Yeah, it was it was an interesting flashback and I don't I guess it makes sense, but yeah, I was a little confused why there was a Kaladin flashback here. I think we had one earlier in this book that we felt the same thing on. I could be wrong, but I think there was a Kaladin flashback somewhere thrown in there. Um But what what I thought was really exciting about this first chapter was um Shalon I guess talking with Ja Anat again. She, yeah, so there's an honor spren, or what she assumes to be an honor spren. It looks like an honor spren. Sorry, not an, a glory spren. Excuse me. And but it's altered in the Ja Anat corrupted altar way, and it lands on her arm, and it's Ja Anat just you know catching up. <laughs> she just swings by to give her a message. And she says a couple things. Did you guys pick up on what Jean Not had to share for us? Jean Not told them that Odium thinks they're dead, right? Or that she, Jean Not is, is a she, right? Yeah. Yes. Ba basically, she's covering for them. Right. At least that's what she claims. Odi Odium is not sure. And so he sent Fused to Shadesmar to hunt for them. But Jean Not has said, Oh, if they're in Shadesmar, they're not near me. I like they're pro they're far away somewhere. So she's she's covering for them in that she's claiming that they're dead, but if they're not dead, I don't know where they are. And Jean Not's lying to Odium about that. Another thing in that discussion, Jaanat says that Odium thinks that Shalon is an else caller. Yep. And not a light weaver. And that that struck me as maybe not super important, but kind of interesting and slightly odd. We know that else callers can do the the travel through Shadesmar thing, right? Right. So Perhaps that's a part of it, but also like, why else? Why? What? Why does Odium think that she's an Els caller? Because Yasna is an Els caller, right? Yes, that's our only other example. So, and so there's actually this is very relevant. I was having a conversation in a spoiler channel in the Discord today about this because if you guys remember last episode. We were talking about Shalon and her relationship with Shadesmar and why she doesn't just use the Stormlight they have to exit Shadesmar. And here is what we talked about. The reason why Odium is assuming she's an Else Caller is because Else Callers can jump in and out of Shadesmar with their transportation ability. Light Weavers have transformation which is soul casting they can change things from ability for, from you know solid to gas stick to fire etc etc sometimes if they're good unless it's and, a, a stick right so odium <laughs> assumes that she's an else caller because they're now in shadesmar probably and only else callers can transport people in and out of shadesmar Light weavers with soul casting can touch Shadesmar and like affect things in like soul cast things in Shadesmar, but they can't enter it and leave it like else callers can. So that is why Odium assumes she's an else caller or whatever transportation. Anyway, that's why she he assumes she's an else caller because if they're not dead, they jumped into Shadesmar. And else callers can do that. And light weavers cannot. Does that make sense? It does. It does. And I don't know if that's going to be important that he doesn't know like what her powers are necessarily, or that he's mis mistaken what they are. Maybe it will, maybe it, it won't. But I'm going to remember that if Shalon does have some sort of 
showdown with with Odium. If she has powers, he's not expecting that might help. Maybe. I will say, so this is also, if I'm remembering correctly, doesn't it describe some of these Spren as being like corrupted? Whatever, or you kind of mentioned that earlier. That's, yeah, um, that's Jean Knott's influence. Whenever Wherever she goes, she corrupts Spren around her. Okay, okay, that's right, that's right. Yeah, and I knew we had seen the corrupted Spren before, but I guess I was thinking of it differently in, in Shadesmore. Um, I forgot what I was going to say, but it was something very important and tasteful. <laughs> Do you want us to move on to talk about Kaladin's part of this chapter, or do we want to wait? Yeah, you can go I'll, on. I'll mention probably wasn't that important. I'll mention one thing while while oh. Paul's thinking. I gotta say, Shaw not seems evil with his whole corruption power, but at the same time, I'm fairly convinced that we can trust Shaw not for no other reason than why would she be doing any of this if we if she's really working for Odium. Why does she not just bring Odium right to where they are or tell Odium where they are? Like, clearly, Jana is helping them, which makes me inclined to trust her, at least for now. Paul, you remembered what it was? I did. <laughs> as soon as Elliot said something, I remembered. Um, I just merely I, I wanted to acknowledge that I think we've, we found them. We finally have who I would say is just head and shoulders the big bad guy of the entire series, which is Odium. I'm just kind of grateful for that, because we kind of wondered for a it's long time. It's not Shalon? <laughs> um, Shalon's like, you know, up there. B-tier? It's like, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. No, uh, Odium is like S-tier, whatever, you know. But uh, that's, just kind of, that's just kind of exciting. Like, we've, we found... <laughs> A year and a half later, almost two years later, we found the, who the bad guy is. We've answered that question. So that's kind of exciting. Um, and I kind of wanted to acknowledge that. But on what Elliot was saying about Ja not, you're right. With what we've seen, it's like, okay, we could kind of trust Ja not. It's like, that was a really nice move to like kind of cover for us. But I still don't trust Ja not. And I don't know why. Well, may, maybe it's because she's an unmade, but <laughs> that might have something to do with it. Um, but I, I, mean, I, I can't do it yet. I'm guessing that there's some kind of like selfish desire that may not be good, or I don't know. Maybe we'll see a redemption story. That'd be kind of cool. But I'm gonna need a little more convincing. It really just comes down to what her motive is, right? She's obviously lying to Odium. Yeah. But why? Like, why is she trying to help Shalon? Is she trying to help? Sh like, what? What's the actual detail behind this? Mm -hmm. All right. So Kaladin's part of this chapter in present day Kaladin, as opposed to flashback Kaladin, which isn't labeled in the book. Present day Kaladin goes into this lighthouse, sees a Shin man sitting next to a crystal ball, which is covered up to start. But the Shin man kind of jumps up when he walks in and says, oh, hey, you're, you're cutting it pretty close. The high storm's almost here. You came for your fortune, right? And Colin's like, uh, okay, great. Touch the crystal ball and we'll tell your fortune. And, well, I mean, one thing leads to another, but Colin is just like, I, I just came for food and, and passage. That's all I want. I want a ship. And after, after he touches the crystal ball, which we'll talk about here in a second, uh, the guy's like, well, why didn't you just say so? I've There's a ship coming literally in like two hours, but, you know, I, I just think he, this guy's pretty funny. He's kind of wacky and weird. What, what were you guys' thoughts before we talk about the vision that he gets? I will be very honest. Yeah. There was a lot of information in these chapters and this this whole episode we're going to be talking about. Uh, like you were saying, this like part four is kind of an info dump, and I, I believe that because there's a lot. So honestly, my second time through, I kind of didn't like think very deeply about this. So 
like there, there was a lot that happened, but I don't know that I really like dug into to this like fortune telling part much. I actually took a different tact here with what Kaladin sees here. He sees Dalinar in danger and, and kind of just comes away with this impression of I gotta I gotta get to Thalen City to help Dalinar. I gotta gotta get there no matter what. The kind of vagueness of that urge doesn't sit well with me. Like, I'll trust Ja not the unmade, and I'm not going to trust this strange vision that he sees through this crystal ball with the weird lighthouse keeper guy. Like, there's just enough going on here that's like, hang, hang on a second, man. We We've seen how passions can be used against people is that what's happening here i'm suspicious yeah that's true there isn't really much and azure calls him out on it right where she's we, we can't really trust what you're what you're seeing we need to stay on stay on target you know yep So I, I don't doubt that Dalinar needs help. I don't doubt that there's going to be some kind of showdown and Dalinar is going to desperately need Kaladin. I don't know that Thalen City is where that's happening, or I don't know that Kaladin needs to be following this urge right now. I think, yeah, I'm, get out of Shades, Mart. That seems to be objective number one at this point. Right. There's one thing I will mention about the crystal ball fortune, whatever here. It's very much portrayed that this is kind of a scam that like, he's just out here because nobody trusts him. And he, he this is, you know, he's the weird old hermit guy in the shack that nobody talks about. And Kaladin touches the crystal ball and actually sees something which surprises the fortune teller guy. And what does he ask him? Do you guys remember? He says, are you invested? Yes. He doesn't say, are you invested? He says, you are invested. What heightening are you? Oh, yeah. Do you guys know what that's a reference to? And being a Knight's Radiant. Ah, uh, no. He says, you're, you're a Surge Binder. What does heightening uh. mean? Heightening goes back to the breaths that we saw in Warbreaker, right? Correct. That's where they talked about, like, if you have 5,000 breaths, you are at fifth heightening or something. Someone's going to correct me on that because I'm making this up. But, you know, the different levels of, like, abilities you gain by the breaths, which we've talked about before, we compared that to Stormlight. And I think, Trevor, you even told us at that time that investiture was the, like, common term for that. Right. So it was cool to see that here in the the text here of him, this random guy kind of referencing that inner power in two different ways that we've seen before, heightenings and stormlight surge binding. Right. So Kaladin walks into this lighthouse and he, when he realizes he has investiture, which is, you know, magic in the Cosmere, he immediately assumes he's from Warbreaker, not Roshar, right? He like that's his first instinct is, oh, you're you have a what heightening are you? That's his first question, and then he corrects himself. He says, wait, no, that's not right. You're a surge binder. You must be a surge binder. So there's actually pause right there. There's actually a third one that he goes to that he like cuts himself off in the middle of and and paul i was almost i actually i don't have this safe so i'm not gonna be able to flip to it quickly but i was wondering if it was a reference to mistborn and, and you don't even get the full thing of what he's gonna ask him trevor maybe you know this because it'll take me a few seconds to find it but i noticed there was another one i'm assuming a reference to some other type of invested power but it did not ring any bells Trying to remember the word he uses, but yes, there is a third one. And I will say, no, it doesn't have to do with Mistborn. 
was going to say my Mistborn senses are always super high as I'm I'm currently I'm about halfway through Well of Ascension now the second book um and like any time that they mention something cat related that like usually catches my my eye I don't remember seeing anything about that so I've I've actually found it here so he he says, you're invested. What heightening are you? No, something else. Merciful, Dame, and it cuts off there in the middle of whatever that word is. And then he ends up on a surge binder. So whatever merciful, Dame is supposed to be like dominion or domination or I don't know where that was going, but interesting little teaser dominoes. tidbit there. Yeah. Dom- merciful dominoes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not going to answer that. Sorry. Nice. Didn't expect you to. Anything else from this chapter? I feel like this is one that will be really fun to reread. I do. I do think you guys are pretty funny that you are, will trust Sean not, or at least Elliot will, and you won't trust the crazy guy with the crystal ball. Like, out of those two, you're more willing to trust the unmade, but. I just think it's pretty funny. Yep. I kind of trust him. I just like, I ha- I'm, you know, taking his words with a grain of salt. Like, you know, what's this crystal yep. ball? I don't know. I'll, I'll definitely put my life in the hands of the ancient evil spren of odium over the uh, random Shin guy in the middle of the wilderness, for sure. Mm-hmm. Sounds I good. I thought he was Shin, but I don't know if that means anything. Shin just means he's white and not Yeah, Yeah, I understand, tan. but like... They are like there. It's always like emphasis on it. I feel like like Shin. Like. Right. All right. Chapter ninety eight. We get Zeth content. Do I need to say more, Paul? Take it away. All right. So Zeth is here. Is this when he's trying to get his second heightening? No. He he has his second. He has his okay. second ideal. He's pushing for his third, and he's playing. Paintball. He's playing paintball. Yes. So he is. It's like a competition, or um, basically a way to prove yourself. Almost it seems like for the skybreakers. And so they have all of the second heightening. Um, I keep saying heightening. Second ideal. Ideal. Uh, start skybreakers. <laughs> I'm getting all mixed up here. Second <laughs> ideal skybreakers here. Um, See and a steel pusher too. The, Yes, it's a coin <laughs> shot. Um, now he, who, um, all the ten eyes. Okay, I'm done. Uh, okay, I don't remember all the rules for this paintball match, but basically, it's fly around and hit as many people as you can, and get hit as little as you can with these paintballs. Um, and whoever has the least marks on them at the end kind of wins. Um, and is the winner like do they get a high sprint and like move to the third ideal or is it just like a good job i don't remember for sure how much stakes are on the line um so just a quick answer to that skybreakers are you can go to the second i you can go to the second ideal pretty easily i mean easily whatever but the third ideal is completely dependent on your spread so when the spread shows up that's when you can say the third ideal and towards the end of the chapter, a spread does show up. Seth sees him, says, no, I'm going to say the third ideal right now. My spread's right here. And the only thing that stops him is Neil comes uh, dropping down from the sky and says, nope, we're going to go over here. And that's how the chapter ends. Yep. Um, so what really like happens here is Zeth has been given surge binding powers again, so he starts to fly, and he's really excited because it kind of, you know, it's like riding a bike, I guess. Like, you never really forget, and so he he's way better than everyone else, or at least all the other second ideal Skybreakers. I believe there were some, like, more advanced ones that are also around, and they kind of try to, like, pick on them. It almost felt like a, I don't know. Like a playground bully. Yes. That <laughs> kind of thing. And uh, and Zeth kind of gets back at him and starts causing a lot of problems. But he kind of uh, 
sneaks his way to victory by falling into the water and it washes off all his paint and so he wins um, kind of a a loophole in the in the rules there which i found really interesting i'm i'm reading this chapter i didn't take a ton of stuff out of this chapter is an interesting little scene with Zeth, but I'm I'm trying to decipher the skybreakers as we as we read this. You know what what are they really about? What are they trying to do? How do they go about it? And that result there is an interesting bit of supporting evidence for that. They're big on rules, right? That's the whole thing. It's all right. about laws, but apparently they're also about loopholes, and it's a good thing that Zeth found the loophole. And they're like, oh yes, yeah, so this guy's impressive. He has found the loophole. It's it's like, I don't know. I'm kind of scratching my head at, at that one. Clearly, they are very all in on letter of the law. Right. They they are not about spirit of the law. They are all about no. What is it exactly? Say. I'm I'm now picturing a bunch of like warrior lawyers, basically. <laughs> yes. There's yeah. It's all about the attention to detail. If it's written down somewhere, if that's the rule, that's what you do. If it's not written down, do whatever you want. Yeah. Yep. Very, very black and white. Very, yeah. It's either in the rules or it's not. And if it's not in the rules, then you're encouraged to exploit it. It's, yeah. Interesting. Any tidbits or easter eggs in this chapter besides the nail content which we'll get to in a second just one just one little nugget that i i left this chapter with and that was a vasher reference it's of course zeth is talking with nightblood and nightblood says oh yeah do you know vasher he teaches swords to people now and on that statement and that statement alone, I'm going to claim my my theory of Zyle is Vasher from way back when we first met Zyle as 99.5% confirmed. Because that's what Zyle does. We've got enough sneaky evidence kind of hinting towards that. Now we have Nightblood saying, oh yeah, Vasher, he's around. He teaches people swords. So, yep, I'm claiming that one confirmed for sure. I think so too. I think that's safe. That's and I will now. Hesse's Mythica. Yep. Even better than Hesse's Mythica at this point, in my mind. I'm going to be mad if it turns out I'm wrong, basically, is what this is coming to. Anything else before I talk about Nail? Go ahead. So just. Not too much besides he drops down from the sky and says, everybody come with me, except for the squires. They burn too much stormlight. We're going to leave them here. I'm going to show you all the two most important secrets I know. And that's how the chapter ends. Now, any hypotheses on what these have to do with are these the secrets that yasna knows are that she won't share or is this something else definitely not yasna's secret because you wouldn't have told us is it this <laughs> if it was that i i might so we can rule that one out if maybe if you named a couple i would have been like oh maybe one of those was accurate but nope i'm ruling that one out right now um, but I'm glad you asked. Glad you asked. I need to think about this a little more. Can uh, I give you another I'm misleading sure. clue? Sure. So in the the night Gavilar died, we know that Nail is in the castle. Right? Yep. Like I'm I'm not telling you guys anything you don't know. And yep. Was we'll Yezrian too? There was another Herald. Uh allegedly saying it may be Yazeriza. He was talking to somebody else okay. who was complaining that he was going crazy. So okay. I'll, I'll leave it at that. Anyway, um, 
Nail and Zeth are buddies now. What did Zeth walk away from the castle with that night? The Dark Sphere. The Dark Sphere. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. That's all I'll say. Now, now you can make your. What okay. What are the two most important secrets he knows? I really don't know what to guess as far as his secrets. I can just kind of think through the big secrets that we know are out there. There's the the, the big Knight's Radiant secret that the Stormfather and Yasna know but won't share. There's where are the Heralds. We know we've met a few of them now, but there's definitely more that are out there. So where are they? That's something I could see Nail. Nail's like a know where people are kind of dude. So he probably knows that. The other big one on my plate I'm thinking of is cultivation where where is cultivation in all of this and we've we've theorized on this maybe a little bit of we know honor's dead odium's here being all oppressive where's cultivation and how does cultivation play into this maybe that's a part of a secret that that nail knows that's about all i can think of You look I'm like you're thinking think, harder. I'm going to think on mine. I'm going to think on mine a little bit. We can keep going. Sounds good. But I may just interrupt at some point and be like, this is exactly what the secret is. And I will tell you the exact right answer. All right. Before we get into 99 and 100, I want to read, unless Elliot, you want to read the epigraphs. I have them in front of me if you. You, you, you better do it. It would take me a while to flip for them. So go for it. Sounds good. I will read... I'll I'll just read all four of this episode's back-to-back. This is starting in 97 and then going to 100. Of the unmade, Jean Nott was the most feared by the Radiance. They spoke extensively of her abilities to corrupt Spren, though only lesser Spren, whatever that means. Lore suggested leaving a city if the Spren there started acting strangely. Curiously, Jean Nott was often regarded as an individual when others, like Moalak or a Shirtmarn, were seen as forces. Nergaul was known for driving forces into a battle rage, lending them great ferocity. Curiously, he did this to both sides of the conflict, Voidbringer and Human. This seems common of the less self-aware Spren. I am convinced that Nirgaul is still active on Roshar. The accounts of the Alethi thrill of battle align too well with ancient records, including the visions of red mist and dying creatures. So with our 90% accuracy of Hesse's Mythica, I just wanted to bring that up before we push through... Uh, we'll talk about this again in chapter 100 when we get there. But It's nice to get some very specific information on this because I feel like we've been narrowing in on this for quite a while, but th- this is very definitive. Nergaul is causing the thrill, period, done. We've, we've kind of guessed that it was an unmade. We weren't sure who. We'd heard some random names. Now we know. So this is very, very helpful. Yeah, we had kind of assumed earlier in a previous episode that it was Odium, right? Because he's like yeah. over all of like feeling kind of thing. Like right. the greatest passion is his Odium. favorite word. Yes, yeah. Um, and this makes sense, right? This is one of his unmade. So I imagine his unmade kind of cover the broad spectrum of passion. Um, there, so Do you- yeah, I. I I also I'm I'm convinced this is accurate and their goal is the is who is behind the thrill. Do you guys remember about halfway through Words of Radiance, Unmade came up for maybe the first time, maybe the like second or third time. And do you guys remember me asking how many Unmade we'd seen on screen up to that point? And you guys both looked at me like, "Excuse me, <laughs> like what?" <laughs> so I was. I just wanted to bring that back up because I I laughed at that point and you guys were like, what? I I, I was about to say, I was going to ask, I was preparing myself to say, may I ask a Trevor question and say, have we seen Nergaul before? Like, 
he's affecting the Alethi, and apparently the Voidbringers or the Parshendi or someone. And I was like, hmm, have we like some? Where 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 is he? Where is he actually? Like, where has he been? Is he like? I don't know. We're kind of skipping over to a hundred if I answer that question, but. I will answer that question in about 10 minutes. We'll need to talk about 99 first. Perfect. Somebody want to start 99? I'll start with a little, a little piece that's not actually super relevant to the rest of what goes on in here. I keyed into one little phrase, which this is another one of those where I'm like, did Sanderson intend to like reference this? Or is, am I like looking too closely at this? Let me, let me read this, and, and Paul, you can help me decide what we think about this. This is the very beginning of the chapter. When Kaladin awoke on the ship in Shadesmar, the others were already up. He sat bleary-eyed on his, on his bunk, listening to beads crash outside the hull. There almost seemed a pattern or rhythm to them. Or was he imagining things? And the word that stuck out to me was Rhythm. rhythm. Why in the world is there a rhythm to the beads that are crashing against the hull? And this doesn't seem this doesn't seem too strange, right? If you're on a ship in the ocean, there's going to be kind of like a, a rhythm of you like crashing through the waves. But this specific word choice of rhythm, we know that the Parshendi, the listeners are tied into Shadesmar more than maybe, or tied into Spren more than maybe humans are, and they hear this array of rhythms. Is Kaladin hearing one of those rhythms, or is he hearing like the source of some of these rhythms? Or is this completely unrelated and this is just the crashing of waves in the ocean? I really don't know, but I saw the word rhythm and it caught my eye. Real quick before you chime in here, Paul, I just want to say two things. One, Brandon Sanderson is very careful with his word choice. Very sure careful. Is. There is, there are multiple times, and there's actually one next episode without any two major spoilers. But next episode, there is a specific word that he uses for rereader specifically, and I'm not going to tell you what it is. But this happens all the time. Two, do you guys remember back in? Oh, what's his name? Relaine. Uh, we had a Relaine chapter maybe back in part two. And Relaine kind of muses to himself where humans might oh, yeah. sing on rhythm for like, you know. Like accidentally. Yeah, like ha for like half a bar and then they're done. Like just every once in a while, like humans would, you know, look up to the rhythm of whatever and then you know, keep on going with their day. Just wanted to recall that real quick. That's fair. So the way I'm taking this, Elliot, I feel like we've seen a lot of illusions while we've been here in Shadesmar. Even, even the word choice of pattern, this is a stretch for me yeah. to say, but I vaguely remember hearing, vaguely, a long time ago, I think when we were summarizing the first or second book, that there is another magic system. I don't even remember which book it's from, but they basically like draw patterns in the air and stuff like that. Am I wrong? You are not wrong. That that was okay. brought up by Nate in our yes, uh, we're talking about magic systems. Yeah, in our Warbreaker. Um, that's right. So with that, I, I, that's always just kind of stuck in my head. I've never thought about it, but we've seen random things. I'm kind of taking this like I'm discounting all of this into Shadesmore is kind of connecting everything. Right. Like, maybe all these different physical places have the same cognitive realm, sort of-ish. Mm -hmm. And so you may have a bunch. We may have the rhythms at the Parshendi here. We may have patterns from whatever. That's a stretch, but that's what I'm drawing from. Um, we may have surge binding, like, just all this stuff. So I'm kind of almost imagining it's like the Wild West of magic systems breaths and like heightenings and all this stuff so i'm taking it as this probably is a connection to those rhythms but 
I don't know how. It's just like the environment you're in. Like you may stumble across a rhythm while you're in Shadesmore. And, and that's a good word for it, environment, because I'm trying to figure out where these rhythms are coming from. And if Kaladin is just kind of coming across one in the nature of Shadesmar, is that where they're coming from? They're just, yeah, kind of like the fabric and the environment of Shadesmar that the the listeners are kind of keyed into. I don't know. Theory. Yeah, what about this? All right, you ready? I'm ready. Um, we have Stormlight. Right. We have Voidlight. Okay. Right. What if, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm kind of, this may not be true, but I'm kind of equating that to Honor and Odium with Stormlight and Voidlight. What sure. if Cultivation has Rhythms? And what okay. if that's somehow that's how that ties in there? And those are like the three little things around going on, you know, power sources that we have in Roshar and stuff. So maybe that is my, you know, we'll come back to that. That just popped into my head and I wanted to say it. That is all. Nothing wrong with that. I'm also just trying to find a way to fake to, to tie cultivation in somehow, some way, somehow. I don't All right. I think it's going to work, but the I was going to say right bef- I'll say this before Rhythm of War came out, you are right on track with everybody else in the fandom. Everybody else was really trying to figure out where is cultivation, you know, and then we'll, we'll, we'll get there. Aren't, aren't you impressed? I figured it out already. <laughs> Good job. Thanks. All right, so we haven't actually talked about the ship, but they get picked up by a ship, and they are. The ship is piloted by Reachers, is what they are referred to. And they basically look like people, but with bronze skin. He, I think Kaladin's point of view here, he describes them as walking statues, is what, is what he looks like to him. And they've got cool spren that fly in front of the ship. There's no wind in Shadesmar, so they, they're kind of just being pulled like a carriage through the beads by these spren. And Syl is undercover. Shalon is giving her a light weaving to cover up that she's an honor spren, because apparently that's a no-no, I guess. Or isn't she just, like, wanted? Like, her, herself? Because she, like, betrayed them or something? She, yes. She's a disobedient honor spren she went to go bond with a human before that was socially acceptable i'm also getting the vague impression from these chapters that honor spren are not super like well regarded in shades or or they're like feared or people are like i don't know there's some weird kind of vibes i'm getting when people mention honor spren in shades right Elliot, in the in the outline here, you have who is Tara in all caps. <laughs> this is another one that's turning into like the dark the the dark sphere, where I think we've had references to this name in all three books we've read now, and they keep coming in just little like thoughts that Kaladin has, like oh Tara would be disappointed in me, oh if only Tara had worked out with me and. And this one is she's he says, "Oh yeah, Tara was right to leave me." Who is this person? Who is this person? This has been on my question list for a very long time, and I feel like we are not even an inch closer to figuring out who this darn person is. All we know is that some that whoever this is falls in the timeline between Tien's death and where we pick up with like Kaladin meeting Syl for the first time and becoming a surge binder like there's a gap of a few years in there so somewhere in there Terra comes into play but i really want to know who this person is and why they're important we got a random kaladin flashback chapter this episode any any hope that we'll get another one with Terra in it oh there's a lot of hope there's a lot of hope and i could see it yeah just coming any second now if we get some sort of flashback to to that person but yeah, it's been 2,500 pages now that I've been waiting for this. So 
It could also be another 2,500 pages that I need to wait. So I have no idea. Anything else on 99? They're on a ship. They're headed towards Celebrant uh, is the city name that is dropped for us is where they're headed to. Anything else for, for 99? We got a little shout out to Windle, which I appreciated, and that was all. Did we? Kind of. We alluded to Windle. There was a br- brief. There was a yeah. brief mention of gardeners among the cultivation spren, and I I wrote down Windle in my notes because it was during the somewhat confusing bit where the captain of the ship is. He he tries to explain it and it doesn't come across super well. Manifesting souls or whatever he's doing, basically he's bringing cold from ice in the real world to Shadesmar to be able to condense water into a bowl so they can drink it. But he talks about he makes a mention of how like oh yeah the this is manifesting souls and uh, the gardeners among the cultivation spread are the ones who really know how to do this or something like that. So uh, yeah, shout out to our our favorite vine dude. Exactly. But we decided it had a British accent. Yes, of course. And a top hat and a coat or whatever. Yeah, he's what? like a little vine with a top hat. Yeah. One more thing. Cool. One more thing before we move on. We've got some Chalon Kaladin flirting happening. It's been a while well, since we knew. It's been a while since we talked about our love triangle. How's that going, Paul? I was hoping you'd forget. <laughs> um, well, it's just uncomfortable. So also, we forgot to mention, Syl makes a big deal to Cal- Kaladin about it, right? And that's Syl's... kind of why, she talks, why he talks to her. Syl is pushing it. He's, she, she's really super, she is super on, on the ship of Shalon Kaladin and Shaladin. Yes, Sh- Shaladin. Kalalon. Cal- Kalalon, yes. And she's like, hey, why don't you go why don't you go talk to her? I know you want to. And the Kaladin's like, yeah, I should go tell her stop wasting stormlight. And so it's like, oh, don't go lecture her. Go chat. You know, have you know it's my job to her. it's my job to make sure you're not lonely, Kaladin. Go go chat. That's, that's where that's where Sill is. Sort of chat. I honestly don't remember what they talk about because I think I'm over it. But <laughs> well, Shalon's a nerd, so they just talk about nerd stuff. So oh yeah, don't they like look at her um, drawings there? I could be wrong. Yeah, I think they look at some of her sketches. You're and right. Like wow, you're really good. And then they move on, I guess. But it's definitely setting the scene for Kaladin and Shalon because honestly, when have we seen a Kaladin and um or, or sorry, when have we seen like a genuine Shalon and Adolin like cute moment? It's been a long been a time. Long. It really it's has because it's always like she's so kind of romanticized, like oh, I love Adolin. And then it's like they'll do some, they'll set up something cute or like notable between Kaladin and Shalon. So yeah. I am in the boat that I think Kaladin and Shalon are, are going to end up together or something. I but have I no wish you'd be with Adolin. I have Kaladin no doubts sure. of Adolin's feelings for Shalon. Adolin used to be the, you know, the the guy who dates everybody in the war camps. But now he's he's pretty well settled on really liking Shalon. But Shalon is I mean she's fairly polarizing, dare we say. Mm-hmm. Of oh I love Adolin. Uh Adolin's boring. Let's go for gloomy storm cloud Kaladin. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, the the emo boy, you yeah. know. It was really apparent to whatever veil, like she was Taking kind of being taken over by Vale, I guess, and Vale was very enthralled with Kaladin, and it was just like such a blatant, like pointing out the subconscious, like obviousness. I don't know. It, it was, it was 
Interesting. And I kind of wanted to stay away from my Kaladin, you know? Something that might throw a little cold water on your Kaladin and Shallan's going to work out is, I think you're right, that it's largely the Vale part of Shallan that's has that attraction to Kaladin. Vale's kind of broken right now. Like, Shallan has problems when she slips into the the veil persona right now what the events that happened in Kolinar kind of made that a a not good place for shallan now so i don't know that might that might slow things down there it's true all right chapter 100 and let's talk about well, let's talk about a couple things. But Dalinar's walking through Vadenar, uh, which is the capital of Yakaved, and the entire city is completely destroyed. There's there's barely walls standing up. Like if you find a house that hasn't been, you know, crumbled at least a little bit, you're really lucky. The whole palace is completely leveled. There's people. There's dead. Be- like pyres of dead bodies just outside the city, just being like that it were burned like a month ago or whatever. And Dalinar comes to the realization halfway through this chapter that the thrill is here. He gets attacked by the thrill in his mind while he's here. And do you guys want to talk about something else before I go on a thrill rant on how this is all going to work, or how do we want to talk about that right now? Go ahead. Yeah, might as well. So do you guys remember way back in The Way of Kings, where it it would describe the thrill as a distinctly Alethi power, an Alethi trait? Yep. Also, do you guys remember that spren are kind of like the actions of spren are kind of localized in roshar where you'll you'll find a drunk spren really common in Erie, but not in the shattered plains or you'll find in alethkar there's a bunch of corrupted spren because jean not is there but that's not the case in your or something like that and the death rattles happen in certain places but not others and yeah. right so the thrill, which we've just learned from our epigraphs, is being influenced by the unmade, Nergoul. And he, he is what causes the thrill. So, back in the days where Gavilar is conquering Alethkar and uniting the High Princes, and basically conquering the High Princes, they, there's Alethi versus Alethi warfare happening. That's on Roshar, that's where the war that's where war is strongest. So that's where the thrill goes. You guys remember talking about the heart of the revel and what came first, the chicken or the egg? Was it attracted by the lust and what's the word I'm looking for? Like gluttony. Gluttony, thank you. Or was it causing it? And the answer is kind of answered here of it's attracted there and then it feeds it so the war in alethkar to unite the high princes it attracts the thrill and then feeds it it follows them to the shattered plains because that's where the war is against the barshendi once that is done it finds the next largest war and that would be the civil war in yakovet so it, it goes over there and it starts feeding the Vadens. And the Vadens have never experienced the thrill before. But when they when Dalinar is here and talking with them, the the soldiers are describing this haze over over the city, haze in their eyes, and haze, you know, you need to keep the momentum, keep fighting. And it talks about their their casualties where a normal army might stop after losing twenty percent of their of their army all like all of the houses would keep fighting after losing 50 percent, and officers would just run around in a battle craze and say hey keep fighting keep fighting keep the momentum 
And that's when Dalinar realizes, I didn't overcome the thrill because I haven't felt it in so long. It left to come here. And that's what eventually scares him into running to, for the Oath Gate and escaping back to your Thiru. So what were you guys' thoughts? And there's a couple more things to talk about in this, uh, this chapter, but what were you guys' thoughts on the thrill? So this has been the most notable, or probably biggest overarching, unmade problem that we have in our story. Um, just overall, like what we've seen reoccurring. And it's made, my main thought is I'm really curious if there are others that we just haven't noticed. But in relation to like what's literally happen, happening with Dalinar moving around, I'm impressed he is coming to the conclusions he's coming to. Um, that's kind of it. I don't know where he's going to go from here. This is now playing into some of my general thoughts about Dalinar, because it kind of brings into question, is Dalinar fully responsible for the actions of his past, or is part of it out of his control, and just simply the influence of Nurgaul and the Thrill? And I don't think, we, we don't have enough information for me to to pick a side on that or, or make a statement there, but it's starting to make me wonder, you know, how much of that that early... Blackthorn, Dalinar that we saw, how much of that was actually Dalinar and how much of that was just him being stoked by this evil power to have this thirst for for killing and for battle. Right. So do you guys remember at the end of Words of Radiance, uh, Adolin is fighting Eshenai and Eshenai is affected by the thrill. Do you guys remember this? Adolin specifically sees Eshenai having the thrill in her eyes and the thrill pushing her on. And in our epigraph, which we just talked about, Nergaul doesn't care who he's pushing. He just really enjoys the thrill of the fight, so he's going to push anybody who's fighting at, at wherever he is to keep the fight. So it doesn't matter if you're a Lethi, if you're Parshendi, if you're Vaden, doesn't matter who you are. If he's there and you're fighting, and if if you embrace it, it's gonna it's gonna push you through. So, I was curious on the like embracing it, because my main thoughts with Dalinar are he he has physically moved away from Nergaul, I guess, but like, can he fight in general? Like, if he fights, will he? struggle with the thrill or is he able to like actually resist good question is this my rafo card or is this answerable <laughs> <laughs> yep i know i definitely want to read more i want to i want to learn a little more before drawing any conclusions on this but it's it's starting to help us understand the situation better i think They use, everybody he meets, in, well, not everybody, a lot of people he meets in this city have just this uns, like stoked anger against him. There's this random Vaden officer who approaches him on the wall and just like trying to get in his face of like, yo, what, what are you doing up here? Who gave you the permission to climb the wall? And every, everybody's just super on edge in this city because of the, the, the presence of the thrill. So. It, it's really and he gets approached by the one of the ardents and says we're denouncing you you are cast out from you know, he doesn't really care because he thinks the almighty's dead anyway but um dalinar comes to the realization of like i have no control over my emotions right now or i'm losing control of my he does eventually well let me rephrase I am losing control over myself right now. I'm going to kill this man if I stay here. And I'm getting super angry at this guy for no reason. And so he turns and runs for the Oath Gate. 
because that's the only out he sees of escaping the thrill is physically remove himself from Vadenar. So that's where that's where he goes. And he gets to the oath gate and realizes he doesn't have a shard blade or a living shard blade. I mean, he um, yeah, he doesn't have a shard blade in general, but and then something happens. What happens? He kind of tries to make the Stormfather a shard blade, and the Stormfather's like, no, I will not be your shard blade. And then he kind of does it anyway? <laughs> like... Yeah, kind of, sort of. It was, it was a bit awkward. I don't know. <laughs> I felt really bad for both parties involved. I was intrigued by this scene because the Stormfather, even in this moment, like reminds him, he's like, uh, don't forget, I'm not actually going to do that for you. And then he does something anyway, but it's very unclear what exactly just happened. Did Dalinar somehow force the Stormfather to become the blade to activate the, the Oath Gate? Which that seems in my mind unlikely. We've seen just how powerful the Stormfather is before, and he's already kind of done things to you know control the situation we know that odium is stronger than the storm father but not a lot else seems stronger than the storm father so if it's not the storm father then what in the world did dalinar just do and my my crazy thought conclusion that i jumped to is we know there's another powerful spren here that's connected to dalinar in some way or some form or somehow did Dalinar just summon Nurgaul? The thrill as a shard blade. To, to activate the Oath Gate? Like, that's what I'm, that's the conclusion my mind is jumping to here of, is there some sort of, Trevor, you kind of let us down what we maybe thought was the wrong path a while back of, like, was Dalinar bonded with the thrill in the past? I kind of dismissed that as, no, that's silly. That's not possible. That wouldn't happen. Now I'm kind of reconsidering that. Is there some sort of like latent bond still going on with Dalinar and what we now know is Nurgaul to the point where he forces some sort of summoning here to activate the Oath Gate? Or maybe I'm going completely down the wrong path. I'm not sure, but that's all I can think of. That's a big one, and I never would have thought of that. Never. Um... Do you guys remember... The first unmade we we saw Ray Shif Ray Shapir in Urethiru. when Shalana is when Shalon touches Ray Shapir. Do you guys remember what happens? She kind of like well, could be wrong. Doesn't she feel like overwhelmed or just like almost overcome? So Ray Shapir like near to her, Shalon. Shalon gets the distinct impression that Ray Shapir is, a f is scared and is just reproducing what she sees. But Ray Shapir attacks her bond with Pattern and attempts to bond with Shalon. That's right. Do you guys remember that? Yes, I do. So I just want to bring that up while we're talking about that this. Was, oh, man. Oh, man. And there's... My, my only other bit of evidence here, too, is in this scene... Like, as this is happening, the Stormfather, like, interjects and says, no, something is wrong. And then, like, it happens. So, I don't know what the Stormfather... The Stormfather, again, seems to know what, what just happened. But, yeah. I, I feel like this is big and important, and I'm not 100% sure exactly what went down. So, that's also what Jeanne is trying to do, right? That's why she's with being Shalon? so cuddly with Ooh. Shalon. Ooh. That's why she's being all sweet. Ooh. I was going to say, so our... There's a motive. Our, our unmade are both good villains and also the worst, the worst villains ever because they literally just want to get all cuddly with the good guys. They want to be like, friends. That's all they want. They, they, they want, want to be friends. They want to be friends. That is their motive. Maybe that's how they... They will just... They... <laughs> Maybe that's how they escape Odium because remember, John Knott was saying... Yeah, Odium made me, but I am, or I was made and then unmade, and I was of Odium, but I am not. I'm just of me now. 
Yeah, I think I was expecting our unmade to be the most loyal servants of Odium, but they're like the yeah. least loyal. <laughs> <laughs> like, so far. Please help. Yeah. Yeah. Literally. That's that's so wow. I okay. I think that's the biggest thing I've learned from our episode today. That's huge. That that is brilliant. I'm gonna have to go think about that. That that might explain some of what's going on with Sha Ja Not. Why Ja Not is helping Shalon. Maybe that is the motive that we were looking for. Oh question. Or follow up point. So what was happening with Asadon? Remember that? So she was like taken over by Yelignar. Yel Yelignar, which is the heart of the revel, right? Or is that a different one? That's a third. There, there were three, three unmade. unmade. There were three That's unmade right. in okay. the palace. Okay. So she was taken over by Yelignar. Does that mean so is it Do we think they're like, I don't know, evilness comes from not them? Like, them bonding with a person is just, like, totally unsustainable, and they, like, entirely take the person over, like we saw with Acedon? Or is that just because she was a, quote, normal person, not, like, a Radiant or something? Like, what would happen if, if one of our characters bond an unmade? Like, I doubt that would be healthy, <laughs> you know? It can't be good for your health, right? <laughs> like, I'm wondering if... if their whole thing is like, oh, we're misunderstood. We want to escape Odium. Please help us. All we have to do is bond, and then you're basically dead. Like, you're completely taken over. Like, maybe, sort of, some way. I mean, I don't know. I'm kind of just running with this ball right now. <laughs> so I like it. So that is one of Nail's secrets going full circle here. One of oh, okay. Nail's secrets is these unmade guys, they want to bond with you and they seem all sweet and cuddly, but they're not. Uh, so that's one of the two secrets. Maybe Nail's already bonded with one of them and that's why he kind of perverts his like, you know, fall yeah. the law thing into a, I get to murder anyone I want to could be maybe so so what yeah well yeah exactly i agree i think that's proven now we can consider that <laughs> as true yeah interesting thoughts interesting and this, thoughts. the second i'm gonna guess that the second one is it's gonna have to it's gonna deal with like the whatever it's called, the Day of Recreants, or whatever happens whenever all the heralds go to, like, to Damnation or whatever to, to fight the... It's going to have to do with that. That's my guess. No, the, the second se secret is that he's actually a Kremlin man. That's true. He's a, he's a sleepless. Yep. Yeah. That's also a good one. Anything else from this chapter? That was a lot. I'm impressed at how much we got out of these chapters. I actually didn't have that many notes on these chapters, but it, as soon as I started talking with you guys, I feel like we, we had a lot of light bulb moments this episode. All right. If that's it, we can keep reading and reconvene next week. Thanks for joining me, Paul and Elliot. Fare thee well. See you.